2023 has been a solid year of cinema, with a lot of directors managing to deliver refreshing takes on well-worn genres, especially in the romance department. Everyone's experience is different, so if there is a film missing from this list that you loved, then I likely didn't connect with it in the same way or I simply wasn't able to watch it. Now, without further ado, let's begin with… Number 10. Oppenheimer Nolan is a master at spectacle, and Oppenheimer is certainly that, dramatizing the race for the atomic bomb in an engaging way, with plenty of consideration given to the various what-ifs present during the development of this previously uncharted area of science. Knowing the outcome of Oppenheimer's invention makes this a tense viewing experience, especially when combined with the outstanding score and those chemistry-inspired visuals. Admittedly, I think this film does better as a snapshot of history rather than as a biopic, which is why I didn't put it further up my list. Number 9. Scrapper this relatively small indie film will hit differently depending on your experience. I may not have grown up on a council estate, but I have lived in London and understand the subculture within this melting pot of Britain. Scrapper's story is beautifully set within this subculture, which is colourfully brought to life through the rose-tinted glasses of a child's perspective. There are some incredibly moving moments, especially the line, I don't need you to replace mum, but I need someone. It achieves a lot in a small amount of time, something I've seen bigger budget films struggle with. Number 8. The Covenant I'm not usually surprised by war films, as they often contain similar characters, stakes, trauma, and suffer from being predictable. However, The Covenant surprised me by focusing on the relationship between soldier and interpreter. As one letterbox review says, I came here for Jake Gyllenhaal but stayed for Dar Salim because the performances in this are exceptional, especially when these characters rescue one another. Some people have complained about the slower third act, but I personally loved how the lack of action was motivated by American bureaucracy that essentially became the antagonist of the story. Number 7. Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret Based on Judy Bloom's iconic book of the same name, which has warmed the hearts of generations of women, this film knocks the coming-of-age story out of the park. However, what surprised me the most was how it considers the important topic of faith as being part of growing up, remaining sympathetic to Margaret's childhood naivety in the process. Furthermore, the way it interweaves the mother and grandmother characters as representations of womanhood later in life makes it an affecting exploration of what it means to be a woman overall, somehow just as relevant today as it is in its 70s setting. Number 6. Barbie I will say that after watching the previous entry on this list, Barbie's thematic shortfalls become far more obvious. But if you take its feminist commentary with a grain of salt and simply enjoy it for all of its creative production design, costume, outstanding character acting, and the obvious delight with which it explores and presents its subject matter, then it is an exceedingly delightful and unique cinematic experience. Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling understand how to present these caricatures of people with hilarious rapport, making them the perfect leads with which to enjoy this adventure. Number 5. Wonka on a similar path as Barbie, Wonka seems to be a kid's film on the surface, with musical numbers in tow. But its writer-director-producer duo, who also made Paddington, somehow managed to make this kid's film reach into the very depths of my soul to retrieve the suppressed joyful energy of my childhood. How do they do this? I am still trying to figure that out. But Chalamet was a delight, his supporting actors were a delight, every dang inch of this film is a delight, even with the uncanny valley Oompa Loompa. It took me on a whimsical journey and I simply can't be mad about leaving the cinema happy. Number 4. Rye Lane as I mentioned in my introduction, it's been a good year for romance, 
well, love-based relationship drama. And Rye Lane is a perfect example of this. It's a rom-com that cuts out the cheese, making Yas and Dom feel like they're genuinely connecting with one another without some divine intervention or sickly sweet meet cute. Their extended date is awkward, funny, and weird at times, surrounded by creative technical details, including the camera, production design, editing, and costumes with brilliantly witty dialogue throughout. It's a London love story that doesn't feel played by stereotypes, but rather informed by contemporary life. Number 3. Saltburn Disturbing, uncomfortable, and a work of art, Saltburn is not going to appeal to everyone, but I think it's bloody fantastic. The sheer amount of literary, artistic, cinematic, musical, mythological, and theatrical inspirations it draws upon is astounding. Most obviously, it takes the extreme emotional and stylistic conventions of Gothic literature and transports them to a modern setting. Even its name evokes the themes of its story. Barry Keoghan has this strange duality to him, where he's capable of switching between innocence and darkness almost imperceptibly. This leaves the audience wondering whether he's trustworthy, and Fennell does a brilliant job of utilizing his talent to bring her twisted tragedy to life. There's a brilliant analysis video by Unleash the Ghouls, which I will link in my description for those of you willing to delve deeper into this wicked film. Number 2. Anatomy of a Fall The courtroom drama has long been an entertaining genre of reality TV and fiction films and TV, with the search for the truth providing the necessary hook to hold an audience. They can be about lawsuits against companies, as in Dark Waters, or young lawyers seeking justice for others who are underestimated like they are, as in Legally Blonde. In Anatomy of a Fall, however, it is a marriage that is interrogated, following the mysterious death of the husband. The dissection of Sandra's life is debilitating both for her and her son, who are made to question each other and the life they've led together so far as a family. We're never told exactly what happened, and the film makes it clear that the only thing that matters is what people believe happened. Made especially difficult by the parental instinct to protect your child from seeing the darker side of married life, this film is a trial of human nature and it makes you question your relationships with others and what you would do in this situation. It might not be the most pretty or flashy film, but this grounding in reality makes it all the more effective once the credits have rolled. Honourable Mentions Killers of the Flower Moon, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a f and The Whale. I don't usually have three honourable mentions, but there is good reason for all three of them, so just bear with me here. Killers of the Flower Moon is, in my opinion, one of Scorsese's best, not only because it finally brings together DiCaprio and De Niro, but also because it's not a typical gangster film. Of course, Scorsese made the gangster film what it is, but the subject matter has been overdone since then. So it's nice to see something a bit different, especially given the real history this film is based on. I didn't give it an official spot because it really is far too long for this format, which makes it difficult to stay engaged and it's kind of predictable. Still, it's a Scorsese film and the storytelling is immaculate, so it's worth noting. The subtle art is here because although I am not particularly a documentary watcher, I found Mark Manson's approach to self-help quite original, particularly his experience with and thoughts about the topic of entitlement, which I think are especially important in current times where the facade of social media is affecting our experience of one another. Therefore, I wanted to mention it as one to watch even if you are skeptical of his apparently but not really cynical approach. Lastly, I wanted to honourably mention The Whale, which is technically a 2022 film and doesn't make the cut, but I was unfortunately not able to watch it before last year's list, otherwise it would have without a doubt made it into my top three. The writing, Fraser's performance, and the delicacy with which it handles its frankly taboo subject matter is absolutely breathtaking. Number 1. Past Lives this is a different kind of romantic drama that doesn't allow the what-if 
to materialize. Nora is confronted with two possible relationships that represent two different lives, which she must choose between. The intimacy and chemistry work that the actors went through in preparation for this film is fascinating, and the consequent wordless exchanges are heavy with meaning. It's thought-provoking, sad, yet somehow comforting, and what words are used always have a purpose. Furthermore, the juxtaposition of the American and Korean cultures as represented by each man and fused together by Nora adds layers of history and nuance to the story, especially with the Korean idea of Inyan. The girl doesn't get the guy, or at least not the one that other romances might have put her with. It's not a fairy tale where the princess is whisked away by a Prince Charming, but instead a conscious choice is made to accept fate, or if not that concept, then to accept the past. So there we have it, my top 10 films of 2023. Please consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and switching on notifications as it really helps us out. Comment below with your favorite film of the year. For more film content, feel free to follow us on Letterboxd and TikTok, links in the description. Otherwise, this has been Tea Break Film Reviews, my name's Michelle, I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you in 2024.